I'm speaking today with Graham Sazama. Graham is a professor in the Department of Chemistry at Lawrence University in Appleton, Wisconsin. I've known Graham since 2008, was it 2008? I think that's right. Yeah. Uh, when he was a senior undergraduate professor at Shannon Stahl at University of Wisconsin-Madison. At the time, he was uh, visiting graduate programs and I was assigned as his host during Prospective Student Weekend at Harvard. He decided to come to Harvard and ended up joining the lab of Professor Ted Betley, who I believe had just started, you know, plus or minus a year of that time. Yeah, I was in his second year. Student okay. Uh, so uh, after earning his PhD, he moved to MIT to work on organic electronic materials with Tim Swagger. He started his current position at Lawrence University in 2016. So the first question, uh, the, the typical uh, first question is, what is the thing about raising chickens that you wish you knew before you had them? Yeah, I love this question. That's so funny. Um, so I kind of didn't know what I was getting myself into. It was my, uh, my wife's idea for a project. Um, building the coop was, was then the portion of the project that I really dove into headlong. And I have a very robust chicken coop. It is definitely overbuilt, but uh, I think that's good. I think that the thing I didn't know, though, that getting into it is that chickens are really cool, actually. I had heard that they were mean and everything like that, but at least our, our birds are very kind. <laughs> They're very nice. They play really well with our kids. Um, and I've had a lot more fun raising them than I thought I was going to. I thought it'd be a lot of work and no fun, but it's actually uh, it's, it's a nice balance of both. So that's fantastic. Is there anything yeah. from your training as a professional chemist that has helped you raise chickens? Uh, unless you want to call like an, uh, an, uh, affinity for tinkering. Um, no, not really. I, <laughs> I think, uh, chickens are, are pretty natural beings in that, you know, they just, eat, they do what they need. Uh, they kind of take care of themselves and, uh, not a lot of scientific knowledge has gone into my my raising of chickens yet. We'll see. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's coming around the corner. <laughs> Fantastic. So, uh, why chemistry? Um, why not physics? Why not biology? Uh, that's a great question too. Um, I do love working with my hands. That's probably true for biologists and physicists as well. But I think that the, the level of, uh, engagement with the natural universe is, is exactly right on for me. It's that kind of material, uh, aspect of things where you're changing the materials themselves and you're, you're really investigating that kind of material level. You know, physics is, is maybe even more fundamental than the materials themselves. It's, it's stuff that applies to every different material. And, and biology is this super complex system. And for me, the confounding variables, not to mention the potential ethical quandaries for me that I never wanted to get into with biology. I can avoid all of that as well. So with chemistry, I have just as much control over my variables as I like. And at the same time, I can, I can really, you know, really get into it and see what, what, you know, what is making this molecule do this thing. And I've, I've been kind of interested in, in that aspect of chemistry for as long as I can remember. I can remember being in my garage as a kid in the summer and taking a coin that I had and heating it up in a flame and trying to melt it and do stuff like that since I can remember. So I've always enjoyed manipulating material properties in a way that's, um, you know, fundamental chemical changes. Awesome. I, I also enjoyed the, uh, per, the ability to, to personify atoms and functional groups and <laughs> fluorine being the greedy atom and the capitalist rule of electron pair donation, the more you have, the less you want to share and so on. <laughs> and I think that, that that's why similarly, uh, why chemistry was the, the center of the bullseye uh, for me. That's incredible. Um, yeah, yeah, you fit in at a liberal arts institution. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, speaking of, of which, when did you uh, know you wanted to teach primarily? Well, that's, that's a, a, a great question because it, I'm not sure it was like flipping a switch and saying like, yep, that's the thing I want to do. I think I always knew that the, the realm of academia was something I was, I was interested in. I've always loved mentoring and sharing my you know, knowledge of techniques or, or my interests and in things with people um, in, in a way that was really, you know, building together uh, towards some, some new kind of, foundational knowledge if, if you're lucky, right? Um, and so uh, 
I've always wanted to do some aspect of teaching. And I think, you know, if I'm reading between the lines on your question here at a PUI, I'm teaching in the classroom a lot more and a lot less, you know, at the, at the bench or in a, in a mentorship kind of role, although there's a lot of mentorship actually in this job as well. Um, and so I think I've always been open to the idea. I always enjoyed my TAing experiences. I actually TAed when I was a student at uh, UW Madison um, and actually in a gap year between undergrad and grad school. So um, I, I had been in, I enjoyed being in, in front of the classroom there. Um, I've always kind of enjoyed the the performative aspects of teaching as well. I did a lot of uh, improv acting in high school and things like that. Skills which have have been helpful, I think, as a teacher. The oratory um, aspect. That, yeah, exactly, exactly. So yeah, I, I think I always knew I wanted to teach, and then as I came down, to, you know, to the middle of my postdoc, and I really had to do that soul searching, like what kind of job do I want? It was kind of. I, I had an open mind. I, I love doing research. I love mentoring, like I said. So I, I actually did apply for both PUI jobs and R1 jobs. But um, PUI was, meaning primarily undergraduate institution. Yeah, like, sorry, I jumped right into that acronym. Typical chemist, right? <laughs> uh, so yeah, I when I when the applications came to me and I started really thinking about it, there were some some. Uh, you know, advantages, both practical and, and theoretical to, to the, the teaching institution that I really was drawn to. How was the mentoring structure in your applications, particularly to PUIs? I mean, it's not something that people at R1s tend to have a lot of experience with. That's true. And, um, uh, I got some good advice from three sources. So, uh, first of all, I was in a really large group. Tim Swagger's group is, um, you know, among the larger ones. And so there were a lot of uh, postdocs in the group I was in, including a few who were interested in the same kind of job. And I think that was uh, the first one. I had a lot of conversations with my colleague, Derek France, who's now working at uh, Cal Poly SLB. Oh, wait, no, San Luis Obispo, sorry, SLO. I'm uh, over here in Wisconsin. So <laughs> my Cal State schools are a little mixed up. Uh, and Derek um, really got me thinking about this as a trajectory um, and was able to, to kind of help me um, think through the process of applying. Um, there was a great handbook put out actually by the Council on Undergraduate Research um, that I found to be really useful, all about applying to jobs at primarily undergrad institutions. And that's a publication that is still available. Um, there was a copy floating around the Swagger group that I was able to take a look at. Um, and then lastly, I had some help from outsiders. Um, and so I had a lot of good advice from uh, my wife who is in the English literature field uh, but has done a lot of mentoring for writing and, and help there. And it turns out that that aspect of my application, I think, was um, maybe more important at, in applying to teaching positions than things like the cover letter and the teaching statement, I think, hold a little more weight uh, for a teaching-based institution than, um, than a research-based institution. That might not be entirely true uh, at all times, but um, I really worked extremely hard on those aspects, and I think that really... Um, uh, did me some some good there. What specifically did you put in the teaching statement? Like, how much do you have to know about the education literature and innovative approaches and and uh, things like that? Uh, that's a that's a great question. The more you know, the better, obviously. Uh, but at the same time, I think you need to express kind of a a basic instinct and understanding of the teaching process. Um, and I think you really need to demonstrate not just that you can do it and you know the, the mechanics of teaching, but that you have a passion for it and a, um, a, a, a real desire to, to do that teaching. And so it's almost a second personal statement in that way that you need to get across the aspect of your personality, that teaching is important. So the mechanical aspects like, do you know about active pedagogies? Those things are, are extremely important and shown to be more effective. They're also hard to do, right? Students hate them at first, mm -hmm. and it takes some adjustment to learn how to do these. Uh, understanding and, and showing your understanding of those in a teaching statement is great. But you also, um, you know, there's, there's, there's another aspect that you also need to get across, which is that personal commitment to teaching. There's a book by uh, uh, Carl Wyman, I believe, um, uh, improving how universities teach science based on the uh, results of a long-term NSF study. And one of the most important 
outcomes or, or, or facts in that, that book or guidance in that book was the importance of explaining to, to your students why you're doing what you're doing, especially if it's not a sage on stage approach. Um, if you're trying to incorporate active learning, you know, you don't just do it. You explain to them why you're doing what you're doing, and it tends to soften them up a little bit more, make them more receptive to the idea of doing it. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I, I completely agree with that that advice. What was the process of applying like? So after the uh, the application, um, is the, the timeline similar to an R1 timeline? Um, what about the interview process itself? What what did they ask you to do? Sure, yeah. Um, I think it's it's similar to R1, um, R1 interviews with slightly less emphasis on the, the research proposal. Um, I think it's a little bit less of a, uh, um, a grilling on your, your proposed research. Um, and actually all the interviews that I did were slightly different in their format. So, you know, the meetings with individual faculty members and with students and, you know, lunches and dinners and stuff, that stuff was all the same, although that's not the same right now, thanks to the pandemic here. But, um, uh, but beyond those things, um, for one institution, so for Lawrence, actually, I did a, a mock lecture instead of a proposal talk. Um, and that was, I think, um, a, that was really helpful for me to, to be able to both think about that teaching statement and what is it about teaching and, and what can I deliver in a, in a mock lecture that really gets across my personality and my kind of, you know, chemical philosophy almost. What topic um, did you choose? Uh, of course, I chose molecular orbital theory. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> that as, a, as an inorganic chemist, that's a... Uh, that's my go-to, and so it was it, at a Gen Chem level. Sorry, <laughs> I see. Um, that that was actually going to be my question at a Gen Chem level. Um, what courses did? Uh, what was the particular line that you applied to for an inorganic uh, professor, or was it uh, more broad? Um, I think all the positions that I applied for at the at the teaching institution level were all specifically inorganic. Positions. There were quite a few that year. I was I was in a, a lucky. I got lucky with that year being a good year for um, many options. I think I submitted in total twenty five applications between both teaching and um, research institutions, which I think is a low number from from what I've heard. Um, but at the same time, it was I was pretty targeted with my searches, both in location and um, I wanted an inorganic position specifically. So. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so what about the research uh, aspect of your job? Tell me about your, uh, your lab, your activities, your, your topic. Yeah, okay, so um, in my lab, uh, you know, I guess by name I'm an inorganic chemist and as it turns out my research has, has skewed in the organic materials direction um, by dint of what I did in my postdoc and then also by what's working, although we do have a, an inorganic based. Um, so one of the big things I did when I, I got the job, I took my startup and I went ahead um, and I bought an EPR spectrometer. I got really lucky because uh, one of our alumni uh, from, uh, from Lawrence actually works at Bruker um, and said he wanted to help me out. So I've got I've kind of uh, an older instrument that has in, a well-loved instrument, I should say, down in our basement now, but it uh, works perfectly like a charm. And so all of my research will use EPR in one way or another. And so I'm doing um, research on organic radicals. We're trying to make luminescent organic radicals, which are a kind of burgeoning field of research. There have been a few reports in the last five years or so where we can actually see molecules with doublet ground states that are able to um, absorb and emit light. Um, they're even building these into OLED devices now and you get some really interesting photophysics from that. So we're digging into that. We're, we're coming up with completely new frameworks and, and finding um, luminescent radicals there. Uh, and then I've got another project where we, we've been working on um, spin counting uh, of electron spins within metal organic frameworks. Um, and so that was a collaboration that I started with, um, or that my, my colleague, Mike Campbell, who you might remember from our time at Harvard, um, he, he's got a, a MOF project with electrons that are in the, the linking ligands for the MOF, um, and we're able to count the spins and really quantify um, how many unpaired electrons they're seeing in those materials. Cool. How how many um, how do you do your recruiting of undergraduates? 
uh, that, that happens in the classroom. So, um, you know, it also happens outside the class. I don't see every student. I see nearly every student um, coming through the chemistry major as, by their second year. I, I've probably seen all of them. Uh, that's partly due to the fact that I teach Gen Chem once a year, at least. Um, and I've also been teaching our organic labs. Um, our, so our first year organic, our first term organic labs. Um, and so I see them, you know, getting their hands right on the equipment from their first kind of go at it with organic. And that was probably the first place I will go for, for recruiting is that direct experience with our students. Is there a lot of competition? Uh, there is a fair amount of competition um, for, for our positions here at Lawrence. We have students reaching out for REUs all the time as well, the research experience for undergrads. Uh, those are an important aspect of our students' education here at Lawrence. I, I can't emphasize enough how valuable those programs are to us um, because we've got, you know, if we have 15 chem majors and uh, five faculty in our department, that's a, a minimum of three undergrads per faculty member and not all of us have been doing research every summer so are those the actual numbers approximately 15 chem majors come in per year uh it's it's changed quite a bit our our uh, our noise level is high on that statistic and um our our department is it has been in, in flux i'm actually uh currently the youngest member of the department we we have an opening for our, our biochemist our our eldest member our senior member of the department was i uh, got his tenure less than 10 years ago. So we're a very young department and we're really kind of solidifying into critical mass. And we've seen our numbers uh, crawling up. I see. That's you have a low dispersity. That's right, we do. <laughs> so we are, we're on our way up and, um, but we've been, we've been at around, uh, you know, eight to 12 majors a year that are graduating out of our department. Do you share lab space? You mentioned that your EPR was in a shared basement facility, but what about like uh, schlank lines and fume hoods and benches? Yeah, so we have, uh, actually the EPR has its own room. It's all by itself. It's got a fume hood in the room with it. So oh, nice. that, that's a, that's, it's a special shrine. <laughs> um, our research lab is a smaller room that I share with our organic chemist here at Lawrence. And I say our organic, because we have one in each subdivision um, for faculty. We're, we're okay. small so you're like the Fantastic Four, the Avengers model. You do that's right. That's, one yes, thing, I'm, do it really well. I need to make those those uh, signs for the department. I think that's a great idea. Um, but we also get to use all of our teaching lab space in the summer as well. So um, our last summer was our where our biggest numbers are synthetic chemists. The two of us had nine students between the two of us, um, and we just spread out through the whole floor. I mean, we've got twenty teaching hoods that we can use. Um, so we had students doubling up. They, they would take two hoods to themselves. Um, and we really spread things out that way. So um, we do we do all right for space, yeah. Mm -hmm. How about financial resources? So you mentioned REUs are really important. Do you mean like specifically like NSF REUs or uh, other other programs? Um, and if those are covering the students, then what about consumables and equipment and stuff? Sure, yeah. So the REUs are important to us more for the opportunity than they are I mean, the funding is obviously just as important because, you know, it's it's not fair to ask undergrads to do research without paying them, at, at least my philosophy. And at least that especially in the summer. Exactly, exactly. Um, uh, but just because we, do, we don't have the, the size as a department to give all of our students constant, you know, every summer, a summer research opportunity, and those are so important for them, the REUs give us kind of a little bit more of a, a bandwidth to, to fit more students in and get them more research opportunities. Um, as far as funding is concerned, uh, we've worked hard as a faculty to secure sources of funding. So we have grants through uh, the Sherman Fairchild Foundation and through the Claire Booth Luce Foundation uh, that support a lot of our students. Um, we also get, get external grants for several others. And then Lawrence is also pretty generous with internal funding for students and equipment. Um, so Lawrence has been covering uh, student living. Uh, their housing is covered over the summer. Uh, and then they're also granted a, a reasonable stipend for their, their summer work. So um, some of it's internal, some of it's external. I was fortunate enough to get a, an ACS PRF grant at the beginning of my time here. And that was a, a very valuable grant and really got my uh, students going. So Great. Tell me about your instructional style. Um, what, to what extent do you, uh, do you use active techniques, if at all? What, what is your opinion of that? Yeah, um, I, it's, it's always changing, for one. Um, 
I, I come from a line of my, the, the teachers who have taught me how to teach were the, you know, kind of sage on stage style. So I, I did bring some of that to my teaching. I do enjoy lecturing quite a bit and I have fun with students, but even when I'm lecturing, and I think this is the thing, um, a lecture doesn't have to just be me talking and you sitting silent and doing nothing, right? Even if I'm lecturing in just a, a boring, empty lecture hall with no tech, I can still make that active. You know, think pair share is super easy to do. You say, you know, you give them a, a challenging question and you say, what do you think? Think about it for 10 seconds and then ask the person next to you and try to come to some consensus. I think that's such a simple technique to implement. I also do a lot of show of hands, which, you know, students can be embarrassed to raise their hand if they're wrong, but it, it's usually good for a laugh, honestly, if, if that's the case. And it also gets us all, you know, thinking together and it's a good kind of you know, summative assessment in the moment. I, I really like that kind of stuff. And so, um, so even if I am lecturing, I, I pause and I take a lot of breaks and I, I activate it in the moment. Um, often on the fly, I'll ask a question and sometimes it flops and that's okay, right? It's okay for a student to see you flop and you make a joke about it and you move on because you're going to flop in science, right? That's, that's yeah. part of what science is. Um, so I, I've been building in more um, formal activities like worksheets that we work on as a group or, um, and it, the pandemic has been kind of a, a great way to force us into doing this. You know, I've got an as, uh, asynchronous lecture every week now because I'm at home with my uh, my seven month old. And as much as I would love to just sit and lecture with her in my lap, um, the amount of time she's reaching for my microphone or the pen or trying to you know eat the paper I'm writing on makes that impossible. So I've been working on new worksheets. Um, is the asynchronicity yeah. something that's imposed from the college level or just the expediency yeah. of your situation? Right. My, it, it's, it was completely up to me, the mode I wanted to, to teach in this term. I'm teaching a hybrid class. Our labs are in person. Um, I'm, I was fortunate enough to be able to open a second lab section and then split my class into two. So it's actually only six students and four students in the lab with me at one time. We got 20 fume hoods. I feel like that's good for ventilation. So that was my, my yeah, safety marker. A lot of air changes per hour in a chemistry lab. That was, that was my thought. And then the rest is all remote. Uh, I do two synchronous lectures. I call them lectures. Uh, two two synch synchronous times a week and then one asynchronous just because, um, you know, two full-time jobs and two kids. There's, <laughs> there's not enough hours in the day to do everything synchronously. Sure. Is there anything from remote teaching that you think you'll carry forward once COVID is behind us? Uh, I do think some of these activities, even the asynchronous ones in a synchronous classroom, you know, in-person classroom will be valuable. And, and um, I've really been digging into the resources on Ionic Viper, um, which is an inorganic specific, but there are, I know the organic community, community has organicers, and I think there's plenty of those types of communities around the internet. But um, some of these activities have been really valuable to activate the classroom, even if I'm not there, but if I am there, it's even better. So I'll definitely be bringing some of those in with me. Um, that's a that's a question I haven't, um, I haven't done my, uh, what I call my post-mortem after the class is over to, to assess how I'm going to sure. change yeah, things. Yeah, it is quite teaching. early still. Yeah, we're just in our third week here of the term. So. I always had a, uh, I felt like, a, so I, I do basically a pure flipped classroom and I use lectures recorded from previously in my, my life and I will edit them appropriately and assign them um, as sort of like the video textbook. And uh, to be completely honest with you, I'm, I, I couch it in the language of uh, teaching innovation and I think that the students have a better experience, but it's really just so much easier for me to just interact with the students during the, the, the official class time, knowing that they've already seen the material. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, part of me feels, uh, feels lazy and the other part <laughs> feels like like I'm on the cutting edge of, of innovation. I'm not really sure what the, uh, what, what's closer. It, do, it does seem that I do have to make the exams harder uh, to, to get the same sort of spread. So if that's any indication, um, maybe, maybe they are 
maybe it, maybe it is at least partially successful. Well, wow, that's great. Yeah, I mean, students hate to hear that you have to make the exams harder, but that's a good sign for everyone, right? You got to if, you, if you're looking for any kind of feedback, you want to have a, a bit of a spread. That's that's good. That's good to hear. Yeah, I think that's that's probably another thing I'll I'll take going forward. It's pretty easy to record a lecture on Zoom. I just use a document cam and and I write my notes by hand that way, and um, I'll probably put some of those forward and they are recyclable, right? That's a, that's a benefit for sure. Sure. Um, in staying with the same topic, uh, is your, are you expected in your, for example, tenure package to, uh, to contribute to the education literature? Like how does, how does, how does tenure work at a yeah. PUI? Yeah, it's um, it's different. So the numbers I was given when we started, and actually we've got a task force that's completely redoing our tenure and promotion um, uh, procedures right now. But uh, they probably won't change too drastically from what I what I I'm up against, quote unquote. Um, Seventy percent teaching, twenty percent scholarship, and then ten percent service is kind of the load that they're expecting. And so um, you've got to be an engaged teacher. That's that's the that's the very basic foundation. And, and you know, uh, Lawrence is interesting. We're a small enough institution that they actually survey every student that I've ever taught um, when I go up for tenure and ask them to solicit their opinion on my teaching, which in some ways, especially as a chemistry professor where we've got a lot of pre-meds and a lot of um, students who you know might not be uh, predisposed to liking us in class, uh, even in that situation, um, so when I went up for reappointment, I, they, they did one of these surveys and I got actually thoughtful comments back from students. So I think at least, you know, time heals all wounds, it seems like. And, and I wasn't getting a lot of these, uh, you know, vitriolic comments. That the remembered seem... self versus the experienced self. Experiencing That's right. self. Exactly. Exactly. Or maybe it's just that uh, students don't bother responding if they didn't have a positive experience um, to the same extent. Um, so anyways, teaching is probably the most important aspect of tenure, which is probably no surprise. As far as research is concerned, I am not expected to contribute to the to the teaching literature, at least not here at Lawrence, uh, but it, it is definitely valued if I contribute to the teaching literature. So I would I would probably say that a, a publication for me in JChemEd uh, would probably hold equal weight to something in, say, inorganic chemistry. Um, I think that's probably pretty different at other institutions, but, um, you know, my uh, teaching philosophy does include research as a portion of of learning, and so I'm trying to keep that active uh, scholarship in in the field. You know, we're, look, we're looking to publish a, a paper here soon on one of our our luminescent radicals. Um, so that should, that'll be coming out in the scientific literature. Um, but at the same time, I've got things going in the back of my head for for teaching literature too. How many students do you mentor in the lab? Again, that's up to me. Um, my average has been um, four per summer and that's about as many as I can I can handle um with how about the semester. academic year uh in the academic year that's all over the place but uh you know at any given time I view usually this term is different because of the pandemic but I usually have four to six independent studies um and then my academic advisees which are a whole different uh, portion of that as well what do you wish you knew before you applied to a PUI yeah, this is a this is a um, this is a really good question. I I think um, I had given it a ton of thought before applying and, and to which jobs I was going to apply, and it, I feel like it has mostly met my expectations, um, with the exception of um, I think it would have. I guess advice I would give that you know is to to stay close with your community. Because when you get to an, in, an institution with this size, like I have, you know, I, there are no other inorganic chemists with PhDs at, in my building. So if I want to talk about inorganic chemistry, I've got to reach out to colleagues from past institutions or go to a conference. Um, and so those connections become a lot more valuable. Um, and, you know, I've done my best to do that, I think. But keeping that in mind, like, to engage the scientific community, it, it is a bit more of a challenge. I think that might be one of the, the bigger challenges of, of this job, for sure. And it might, the barriers to maintaining these connections might actually have been lowered by COVID-19 because doing what we're doing now 
never would have happened. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Actually, I don't want to say never, but probably not. <laughs> And that was something, so the Center for CH Functionalization has these online uh, seminars. They've been doing this for several years now, which has been an amazing resource for us here at Lawrence because we just don't have the overhead and the bandwidth to to invite speakers to campus. Um, we, you know, we, we've had opportunities to have them at campus, but we don't want, you know, if we have at any given time 40 students studying chemistry and you can guarantee, you know, only 25% show up for a lecture. We don't want to have someone fly all the way here to, to talk to, you know, 10 undergrads or something like that. But to do it via Zoom, that suddenly the barrier to entry is so much lower. So I, I do think that might be something that as a silver lining on this pandemic, I, I hope we can continue that because this has been valuable for us to have so much more access to talks and, um, and great research presentations. How would you describe the educational experience as an undergraduate at Lawrence or a PUI compared to the three other places that happen to be our ones that you have experience with? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, I guess it, as a, just for a kind of a, a funny anecdote, I, I toured two schools um, for my undergrad and one was Lawrence and the other was, was UW-Madison. So it's a little, uh, it's a little funny. I ended up going to UW um, and uh, so that's my, my undergrad experience at UW and the, the experience here at Lawrence are pretty different. I, I think, you know, for one, it's a residential school at Lawrence. And so you are, you're living on campus and it's a very tight knit community. It's actually smaller as a school than my high school was, uh, which is kind of a, a crazy thing to consider. So how many students total then? Uh, we're, we're around 1500 during a typical, um, enrollment okay. time. It's about so. the size of my high school. Yeah, exactly. It's just a little smaller than mine was. Um, and so, you know, it's a tight knit community. Um, the student professor relationships are very collegial. Um, you know, I get to know my students really well, especially my chemists. Um, and uh, that that can be really rewarding. Uh, you know, I've got students who are off into grad school and, and their you know, careers now and I keep in touch with them. And that's really rewarding for me. And I think I hope for them, too. Um, I think uh, so that that aspect is definitely you know, much different. I was terrified of my professors at, at UW Madison. Um, I, I think uh, there's a there's a lower barrier to entry into forming a, a, a relationship with your professors um, or your mentors here at Lawrence. Um, are there other aspects you're interested in? I feel like that's probably the biggest. I remember walking through the uh, department offices to get you know, an exam or drop something off at uh, Boston University and seeing these professors doors as like, like walking through Petra or something exactly. like these, these temples in a rock face that just seemed so imposing. And... Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about you, but there was always an antechamber as well. So you, you had to go into a chamber and then get even more nervous before you walk through the big right. door. Right? You got to go through the airlock. <laughs> <laughs> the airlock. <yeah. laughs> exactly. So, um, you know, yeah. my door is always open here and students can just pop by my, well, it's not now anymore because of the pandemic, but when, when normal times I'm here and I, I'm happy to talk to my students. And, um, and so that, that's, I have, I think I have more time. It, it's part of my job, right? I'm, I'm encouraged by the structures around me to, to interact with my students uh, more regularly. So I think that's, that's the biggest difference. So you and I are fairly active on Twitter. And I noticed that a lot of people, you know, plus or minus five years, 10 years from our generation, we want to change a lot of things about STEM education, but in particular, chemical education. And I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm going to put you on the spot. What okay. would you change about the way chemistry is taught? All right. So I'll, I'll get on. Um, my, I don't know. I hope I don't get myself in any trouble here uh, with science minded folks. But um, so here I am at a liberal, liberal arts institution. I, I'm married to a literature scholar. Uh, and, and so I think a lot about our personal relationship with our science. I'll give an anecdote. I, I ran an experiment with my son and his two kindergarten friends from our, our kindergarten pod yesterday. We were cleaning pennies with various acids from around the house. I got lemon juice and vinegar and stuff. And I asked the kids who all used a different acid, whose work best to clean off the pennies? 
And every single one of them said theirs worked the best, which we all know is not true, right? It can't be true. Um, I was of the mind that the lemon juice worked the best, but that's neither here nor there. Um, and so I, I think, but that's a story that tells me about how scientists approach our science, which it, it does become personal. And, you know, when we teach stu people to write their science in the, um, you know, leave out the first person, it doesn't matter who does the experiment, you know, that, that kind of mindset's important, but I think we have to acknowledge the humanity in our science and the fact that we get really invested in it. You know, someone who has to fight for grants to fund their science becomes incredibly invested in what they're doing. And that can be, you know, ethically fraught. It can be, it can be challenging. And so this is a big, you know, a big question, maybe a minor problem to be honest, but it's one that I'm always thinking about from kind of a, um, a, a philosophical standpoint of like, what does it mean to do science? And I don't know about you, but I get personally invested in the work that I'm doing. And, Oh no, I'm I'm completely objective. <laughs> okay, time. I should have known. Yes, the the there is a there's the the truth or the extent that we can know the truth, which probably isn't even all that true. Because when a I mean, what does it mean if a if a uh, a yellow photon hits your eye, right? Like, right. Yes, of course. Yes, I mean, we can question. only really register. Uh, you know these these three fairly narrow wavelength distributions, and then our nervous system does something with it and produces some, you know, some color on the thirty-two bit. Don't even uh, get started on, on taste, right? Like, right. How do you feel about cilantro, Darren? Because I, I love it personally. <laughs> and uh, and something we're doing in my own research now is looking at the way that that materials and chemical manipulations to mechanical properties and rheological properties affect the tactile sensation, and yeah. we're learning about. Uh, you know, we're, we're trying to, to, to build the, the library for soft sensations. So what does it mean for something to feel like the liver? If you poke the liver, you know, it's, it's wet. It has a certain amount of tack. Uh, wetness has something to do with thermal conductivity, but also the uh, conformal footprint that it makes against the skin. It interacts not only with the uh, with the mechanoreceptors in the surface of the skin, but also the mechanoreceptors in the joints and ligaments and and muscles. Yeah. Uh, and we don't really know the first thing about how to recapitulate the feeling that's that's like. I mean, even if we knew where all of the action potentials were going, we still don't understand consciousness enough to uh, to give you the uh, you know the the actual uh, not flavor but the touch equivalent of flavor of, of what right. what the what the combination of material properties is. And then you look at just like a scientific fact uh, that you know you don't you don't know that it's that water is h2o except for you know a bunch of instruments that you trust and you trust right. the people that built the instruments and yep. exactly. uh, and so there's like the truth or whatever the extent to which we can know the truth and then there's all this human crap that is like <laughs> in between us and whatever the truth is so right. i i completely i completely see it i i like i i understand your point um, and actually, I don't think you could get in trouble at all for something like that. I was expecting you to say, uh, like, well, Gen Chem is just baby P Chem and <laughs> we need to <laughs> need to do away with that. You know, yeah. not that I would ever say that. But <laughs> I, I like I like to think of it if it is as, you know, slipping a little P Chem to students without their knowledge. Surprise. <laughs> you already know some P Chem now. Look at you. Right. That's a. Uh... Pchem without the without the scary barriers and right. Pchem without the calculus or with with very little calculus. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there anything you wish I had asked you that I didn't? Um, I think you know I wanted to go back to the the mentoring question. I think that um, I think it was it was funny when I made the decision to apply to these schools and and became serious about it. 
um, I was a little bit nervous to tell my advisors because, you know, I was, you know, I was fully dedicated to research in grad school and in my postdoc and I was going to conferences and, you know, I was kind of making all the, the moves to go get a research type of job. And I think when I finally, you know, did some soul searching and thought about what I wanted. And I'll, I'll also say that one of the motivating factors for me was travel, which during the pandemic looks a little bit less uh, relevant, but, um, you know, as a, as a in, uh, undergrad institution professor, I go to maybe one conference per year. Um, and I don't visit other institutions to give research talks. And, you know, that'll vary by institution. Some, some have more active travel. Um, I, I think if you're in a, a denser region of schools, you might see more, you know, here in Appleton, the, the nearest large university is in Green Bay, but, you know, Madison's here too. I don't have as much opportunity for that. Um, so anyways, that was a big portion of, you know, it was a personal choice that led me in this direction, but also, um, I was a little bit nervous about making that decision. And I think in the end, I was surprised by my mentor's response. They were surprised to hear me say it, but they had no problem supporting me and, and helping me along the way to get this job. Um, and, uh, you know, gave me the letters I needed to, to land the job and everything like that. And so I think that um, anyone interested in this as a career should not be afraid to pursue it. And, um, you know, if your mentor is not supportive of you, looking for this kind of job, think about your mentor and whether that's a good relationship for you or not, because it's, um, yeah. And think about it early. Think about when you're yeah. applying for positions that say, this is one of my options. I'm seriously considering what is your yeah. attitude toward it. Mm -hmm. And if they're, you know, not being truthful, you can kind of tell if it's on zoom and you can see their face. <laughs> and, right. Yeah. Uh, y y yes. I'm supportive. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, Tim talked to me very frankly, Tim Swagger. He, he said, when I told him, he said, you know, it's like taking a vow of poverty. He was joking a little bit, but yeah, the, the salary is not as good. I, I can, I can be very clear. You can look at the statistics from, from CNE news and everything. Um, but he also said, you know, that's a lifestyle choice and it's a great lifestyle. And that has borne itself out as well. I got my chickens at home and I have a beautiful house and I, I'm very happy. It's a great, it's a great job. Um, I love my interactions with my students and, and that sort of stuff. So I, I really think, um, you know, that was not necessarily what I expected to hear, but it was a, a nice practical grounded piece of advice that I think has held out. So, yeah. Thank you for bringing this, bringing this up. Honestly, I, it, it had occurred to me to ask earlier, but I didn't want to appear to condescend because that there is a notion that, uh, that people in the R1 world, uh, do not, uh, the, the level of well, we just we know it's true. There are PIs at R1 institutions that think everyone in their labs should be, become an R1 professor. And, you know, anything else is, uh, you know, doesn't, uh, doesn't, doesn't maximize the training or whatever that is. I think that's the right. perception. And that, that, uh, that is actually a, a minority view, um, particularly now. I mean, I, when I hear, uh, you know, favoritism from uh, PIs uh, that, uh, you know, that, that say, well, this person's, you know, great because they want to pursue this R1 position. You know, they, they really don't, it, it betrays a lack of understanding of, of one, the uh, variability in human satisfaction and the sources thereof yeah and also like the arithmetic i mean an r1 professor at steady state maybe over the course of their career should probably only produce one and a half r1 <laughs> <laughs> professors. right exactly exactly right and and not to mention there's a there's another side of it too and this came out in my conversations with my mentors which is that uh part of part of my motivation for a teaching job is I wanted to get in to talking to students earlier so that we can train them up to be more resilient, better grad students. And, you know, you know, I guess if I followed that logic, I should be a, a 
preschool teacher, but at the same time, I had to pick my my level of thinking that I wanted to. Right, just like your here. decision to choose chemistry, the central science. You got to pick right. the the place that matches your skills and your interests with making the the biggest impact. Exactly, exactly. And so, so that's my hope, right? Can I train a student who goes on to be a grad student and make great contributions to their field, however they see fit, right? And better yet, to be you know, a well-rounded member of a group who, who it brings kind of a, uh, you know, whether it's a leadership quality or a, um, you know, a work ethic or something to the group that enhances the whole group, or at least the mentor's experience, right? I, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to, to be part of the cycle as in, as opposed to just, um, you know, you know, pumping out this, the top students all the time. You know, it, it, I think it's taking a ho more holistic view of, of how we educate our students. Yeah, well, you are doing awesome work and doing it for all the right reasons. And the chemistry community is lucky to have you. So oh, well, thanks, dear. That's very flattering. <laughs> I'd like to thank you for your time and uh, we'll chat again soon. Absolutely. I can't wait to see the, the Lapomi scale of material softness so that I can actually have an objective measure about whether my sweater is truly as itchy as I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> right. Fantastic. Thanks, right. Graham. Yeah, take care.